Welcome. Welcome, everybody. My name is Andrew Jones. I am the Executive Director of Climate Interactive. I'm here with Ava DeLeon, and uh, this is the webinar on impacts of climate change and simulation scenarios with En-ROADS. We're going to be looking at impacts, and I wanted to start out hearing from you. So if you would, please open another browser window and answer this question above by after going to polev.com climate inter 935. Ava, if you would post that, I bet you can find it in chat. Go to chat, find the link there, find another, open a browser window. And what are the impacts of climate change that you've seen? Or people close to you have seen? And if you would add where, where are you talking about? Uh, when you refer to this. So interested in hearing from you. Wow, a lot of people, over 100 already showing up. Feeding some secondhand trauma, watching Haleem impacts from afar. Drought, more ticks, more ticks. Wildfire in British Columbia, Canada. I saw some out in Idaho. Drought where you are. Flooding, more impacts that you see. Long stretches of 100 degree days in Texas. I've heard a lot of that here in Texas and the US, the South and the Southwest. Recently, Hurricane Helene and Milton in Florida. Smoke from wildfires, San Francisco Bay Area. <clears throat> if you're just joining, Please open another browser window. We're going to have some polls here. Go to the link that is in the chat and answer this question. Homeowners insurance rates doubled in Texas. My gosh. Piedmont, North Carolina, near here. More rain, drought in your state. Glaciers on Mount Rainier shrinking. Fewer bugs, extreme heat. <clears throat> Note when I got into this field 25 years ago, we were talking about our grandchildren. We were talking about the other side of the world. We're seeing how, as you are noting here, the impacts are here. They are not about the future. And that builds an urgency for all of us, an urgency to prevent these worst case futures. Floods in France, it's dry. Extreme heat and sea level rise in Delaware, drought, wildfires, in California, wildfires in Ontario, Canada, floods, thank you. Okay, we're getting more and more of you sharing what are the impacts that you've seen. If you're just joining, I'm Andrew Jones. I'm the Executive Director of Climate Interactive. We are a not-for-profit climate tech company, and our job is to see emissions of greenhouse gases fall rapidly with equitable policy and use the simulators that we develop along with our collaborators at MIT to help decision makers put in policies that prevent climate change and prepare us for what's coming. You've seen the impact of politicians who are dangerous as they do not understand climate change. Hurricanes that build up quicker, that will be a theme today. Odd weather patterns in New York. Thank you. Okay. Told you about Climate Interactive. I mentioned our collaborators at MIT and the MIT Climate Pathways Project. Our funders, all of these folks, and if you know somebody who wants to address climate change with a high leverage investment, please go to send us a note and support at climateinteractive.org. Just get in touch with us. I want to particularly call out VKRF, VK Rasmussen Foundation. They have funded some additions to the model that I want to show today. With the help of this amazing group of advisors, we've been improving the model steadily in the direction of having more and more on nature. I'm going to show you some of the impacts 
in the context of this simulator. And maybe I think a lot of you out there have seen it before. Many of our, what we call En-ROADS climate ambassadors, if you are one, write into chat and say that you're here and that you're a, one of these people. These are the 814 people in 83 countries who are using this simulator in education, in policy, in business to drive action towards high leverage policies in the 20 languages that it's currently in. So maybe you've seen it before. If you haven't, I want to just give you some of the basics of what it is. The idea is that you can very quickly test policies, say like energy efficiency in buildings and industry, and see what the impact will be and note the difference that it makes. We're going to test more policies later, but for now, I want to pull forward two of the new impacts that are brand new. If you're never seen this, or if you've seen the model before, then you probably have not seen loss in ocean life from warming. I was just talking to Ava about it. This is another graph of what's at stake, that if we stay on the current path from 2000 to 2100, this measures the percent loss of biomass by weight of ocean life. Zooplankton and phytoplankton are the bottom two lines. These are the small organisms that are the building blocks and the food that feed marine animals in blue here, the fish, the mammals like dolphins and sharks, the crustacean, all these animals that live in the oceans rely on, or many of them, from small fish to huge whales, from, rely on these zooplankton and phytoplankton you can see that they are, the loss goes up. Here we are sitting at, what is this? 2.4% of it by lost already. By 2020, it goes up to three, four, five, and six, a little higher for the zooplankton. And up here, you notice it's higher for marine animals. They are more sensitive to the changes in temperature. Many of them are, well, they're cold-blooded, so they're not able to regulate their own body temperature themselves, but are dependent on the temperature of the ocean. That's one of the several reasons that they're even more, uh, there's more loss in that area. You can read more about it if you click on the, the dots here. And Ava, would you send a link to the models so people can go look at this? You can also go look at the, the paper, the papers on which we have, uh, let's see, that we based this work. And for example, Lotsa et al., you can go see the source of that work. Go read the paper that this was based on. The second one that I want to show you is down here in the ocean, ocean area, and let me see, where is it? Loss in ocean life from warming. Hold on a second. I'm going to reload it and get it right here. The It's under impacts. And if you scroll down, extinction rate of endemic species. There it is. Okay, this is extinction risk from endemic species. Endemic species are ones that only live in certain areas or ecosystems. Click on the dots and you can read about them. Giant panda in China, Komodo dragon in Indonesia, emperor penguin in Antarctica. Those are all in the brown area, brown line. We're concerned about, a, what it, by 2030, 2.6% are at risk of extinction rising over time. The marine one, a heartbreaking steep climb there up to close to 30%. We're very concerned about how steep that is. Marine animals at more risk of extinction, partly for the reasons I mentioned before, the cold-blooded nature and therefore the sensitivity to 
ocean temperatures. That's one reason that this is rising so quickly. Now, this is more about what's at risk and what we're going to do in this workshop is to see how can we change that curve and the other that I just showed you through the various policies at the bottom. That's the heart of En-ROADS. And what the offer to you is, can you use this tool in policymaking, in business, in your communities, in education, to help people understand what kind of actions that we could take down here will have impacts up high. That's what we're up to together. I really wanna ground ourselves even more in frankly, what's been a rough week when it comes to typhoons, hurricanes, et cetera. This was in the Western Pacific region and the Philippines. You can see the path here of Typhoon Gamey and Super Typhoon Karina. This was just a few weeks ago. Flooding in Nepal and this was close to Ava was is in Miami, very concerned about what happened with Hurricane Milton, a very unusual west to east hurricane, missed Tampa, but did hit and made landfall in Sarasota. Just to show you a little bit of how we tend to use our simulator in thinking about this kind of risk around the world, uh, maybe... Serious users may not know that beyond the sea level rise feature here in the model, you can look at sea level rise anywhere in the world, but also we're gonna be able to look at storm surge. Storm surge is how much water levels rise at the arrival of a hurricane or a typhoon when it makes landfall, storm surge. So in Sarasota, we type in Sarasota, Florida, and go look there, we can look much larger and see this right now is showing sea level rise in 2100 that's anticipated. There's Florida, here's what would be coming in 2100 and in Sarasota. This is what would be there all the time. But what I wanna do is come back to 2030, look more in the near term, this data from Climate Central, and then click here under storm surge, 21st century with storm surge. And that allows you then to type in, the storm surge there was eight feet. I'm gonna put this at therefore three meters, which is close. And then you can see in your area, if there were to be something like Milton, what kind of amount of land would be underwater with that storm surge. And here you can see all this whole coastal area that should be prepared uh, for what might be coming. So this is one of these tools to say what's coming no matter what, and then what are the different policies that we wanna look at in order to avoid these worst effects. Okay. We don't do this much, but I'm now gonna talk a little bit about Asheville. I live here in Asheville, North Carolina. I've been here for 28 years. Ellie Johnston on our team, our Director of Engagement and our Director of Operations, Danny Sanfilippo all live here in Asheville. It's particularly known as a place that is a climate haven. There was an article two years ago, Americans are fleeing climate change. Here's where they can go. We were, according to this professor at Tulane, the top of the list. And just yesterday, the Washington Post put out a tool where you can type in your county and check out your climate risk. So here it is, select your county, Buncombe County, and we have a very low climate risk. In particular, you can see there for inland flooding, it's high. We get floods here, but a hurricane, very low. This is yesterday is when we did this analysis. 19 days ago, you may or may not have heard, but Hurricane Helene started as a tropical storm in the Gulf of Mexico, got stronger, became a hurricane. Category one, two, three, four. This was the anticipated path. 
I happened to be, as this was all happening in New York City at what's called New York Climate Week, when the UN, United Nations is in a general assembly, climate policy people, advocates all gather there in anticipation of the negotiations that are coming up. I was watching it form as it crossed here Thursday, Thursday, and then towards Friday. And it actually bent east to where we are here. When we think of historic hurricanes here in the Southeast, Katrina that hit New Orleans 20 years ago has is the benchmark. Category three, 400 mile wide. So what came was 822 miles wide, Category four, with a larger wind field, you can see a map of it down there below. Um, it then used to be that these hurricanes would stop at the coast. They'd hit the coast hard and then die out. It traveled 450 miles. It hit the mountains of the Appalachian Mountains where I live when a hurricane hits uh, it goes up when it rises in elevation, that cool, that it, that moist air cools and it drops precipitation. And when it did that, it dropped 31 inches of rain, which is 40 trillion gallons. It's a third of the volume of Lake Erie. And uh, this is what we saw. This is where we used to go to look at art and buy art. It's the Rival Arts District here in Asheville that was totally flooded. There's a town called Chimney Rock. And I want you to look in the right corner. See that little sign, Chimney Rock Village? Here's all these shops on the kind of main street of this town. There's that same sign and it is gone. The people died when that river came through and swept it away and they didn't know to evacuate because we don't expect uh, hurricanes to travel 450 miles. Marshall, North Carolina, here it is before. See that hillside rising to the right? Here's that same hillside uh, gone. Downtown Asheville, uh, a level, well, we're just blooded. The Blue Ridge Parkway is the place that we go to walk and hike and camp. Here in my neighborhood, it was more about the big trees that are around and the winds that knock them down. This is my neighbor, Alan. The tree landed there. Uh, this is my mother's, where she had her changing room, that it, uh, her old home where the tree fell and just broke what's above her head. They've done the math. They think that it could cost 200 and $50 billion of impact. This is in an area where the flood insurance covered 1%, under 1%. Just so 250 billion is a big number. How do you make sense of that? The Inflation Reduction Act is the big climate bill, and it put aside 370 billion to spend to prevent climate change. One event cost 250 billion. So the headline of this, it's it's just a couple things. We used to talk about prepare, you know, save the world for grandchildren or for people on the other side of the world. No, this is now. This is here. This is the urgency that says no one should have to deal with this and go through what this region has gone through. We can do better. We must do better. We know how to do better. We know what needs to happen in business and in government and civil society and around the world in order to get greenhouse gas, greenhouse gas emissions to fall rapidly with equitable policy. We know the priorities. We need better approaches for making it happen. We need the courage to get to the people to make that happen. So this builds an urgency of it's not in the future, it's here. Let's go and do much better. Now, when making sense of this, part of it is telling the story well, and to tell the story well of why this is not a random act, but this is the effect of climate change. Climate change did this. The reason we can say that is because of some amazingly good news in the world of climate modeling and climate science. Ava, can you share some of these links? Uh, the 
over the last 10 years, really five years, attribution science. Look up climate attribution science, where we can say with any event, what part of this was caused by climate change? Our friends at Climate Central, who gave us that map before, have this set, this place, climate shift index. So the weather for the temperatures in any day, what is the change in likelihood due to climate change? How much is there in Algeria, the warmth that they're feeling today due to burning coal, oil, and gas, releasing methane and deforestation, trapping heat, tra trapping in raising global temperatures. How much is the weather today, October 17th, due to that effect? Early on when there would, I remember 2004, Hurricane Ivan and Francis flooded here. And I did some media interviews 20 years ago and they said, well, you really can't say that this is about climate change. And all we could say is, well, this makes these sorts of events more likely. That's all we would say. And we had analogies about steroids and baseball and things like that that would increase the likelihood of a home run was the analogy we would use. Attribution science and the statistical geniuses who have created it now can say, no, uh, we can connect the dots. World weather attribution is another one that's doing excellent work in this area. And this helps us tell the story of what we know and the extent to which we can connect the dots. What did they learn? Global heating, as covered by The Guardian, made hurricanes like Helene twice as likely. It doubled the likelihood. Mark Risser et al., these folks out of LB et al., doing the same kind of analysis, climate change may have caused as much as 50% more rainfall we have a smoking gun. We know that what we've just experienced is about climate change. That's terrible news. That's good news because we can do something about it. It's good news because we can do something about it. Granger causal inference attribution methodology. That's how they did it. These are the folks that wrote it and uh, go read some of their work. The World Weather Attribution says climate change uh, made heavy rainfall 70% more likely in Appalachia. All right, so why, why, how did climate change make all of that happen? The key thing is the Gulf of Mexico has been warming. 1910, 2024, the blue areas is where the temperature is below the average. Now you can see it rising and rising. It's noisy, but you can clearly see this trend up and up, and particularly highest in these most recent years where the temperature has been higher in the Gulf of Mexico. Warm water fuels a hurricane. Warm water drives a hurricane to be able to travel not just inland a couple miles, but 450 miles all the way to right here where I'm sitting right now. I want you to look closely at these recent years. Look at 2010 to 2024, and you can see this little increase. Now notice, so look at how much it's changed in these last few years. Here is a graph that shows the average 2013 to 2023, what I just showed you, and then this specific year. The dotted line is the average, June, July, August, October, November, December, October 7th, and this is the period of time when Helene was traveling across the Gulf, when Milton, just a week later, was traveling across the Gulf, fueling it. So it was a particularly hot year in a particularly hot decade, as you saw here. Why? Why is the Gulf so hot? Why? I'm going to go back to the polls. I'm going to give you a poll, and uh, here we go. Go back to your poll, and here's the question. What percent of heat trapped by greenhouse gases has gone into the oceans? So this is, think of the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, methane, 
nitrous oxide and F gases. These are the blankets over earth. They trap the heat in the atmosphere. Where does that heat go? It can stay in the air. It can go on land. It can go to the ocean. How much has gone into the ocean from 1750 to today? How much? A lot of you are voting. Keep voting. We want to see some more votes. How much? Let's see how you're doing. 70%. Is the main vote. 70% is winning right now. Maybe it's just 30. It's 90. The answer is 90. Water has an incredibly high heat capacity. It's able to take in a lot of heat, while land does not. Think about walking next to, say, uh, a big puddle in a sunny day. So when you're walking next to a big puddle barefoot on a sunny day, the ground is really, really hot, but you go over to that same puddle, to a puddle that's been subjected to the same solar uh, insulation, the rays, it will be cooler because it's able to store more of that heat, put it into it and absorb that heat. 90% has gone into those oceans. The good news is it hasn't gone into land. That's why it's relatively, we only have 1.3 C of cooling on land. We would see so much more if we hadn't been dumping so much of that heat into the oceans. The good news is how it's protected the land. The bad news is what you just saw. Warm oceans fueling Gaitani, that other typhoon, Milton Helene. Okay. That's the causal story about why we're seeing, uh, why we know climate change has fueled this and what we've seen lately. So given that, of course, what it leads to us, us to is what can we do about this? And this is our big offer to you all to have a tool to help anticipate what's coming as we've been showing you, but also explore how much of that can be avoided. And spoiler alert, a lot. Let's go see. What we're going to do is I'm going to ask you to suggest changes in the world based off, building off of this baseline. This baseline here, I'll explain a bit of what we've assumed. This is a kind of conservative future where we don't take huge action to address climate change. Uh, there is a carbon price. A carbon price would make coal, oil, and gas more expensive based on how much carbon there is. It would be higher for coal and less for natural gas. We're assuming $5 per ton. That would be a very small carbon price. Northern Scandinavia, they have... 40, 50, $60 a ton carbon price. There's several in the US and in Chinese cities. We're not assuming it increases out at over time. Technology continues to improve, but we still get a good bit of our energy from fossil fuels because it seems that that's what uh, policies would lead us towards. You can see it all here in this graph from 2000 to 2100. Coal is relatively flat. Oil in red. Blue is methane gas, natural gas. Renewables, wind and solar, growing and growing and growing so much. So we're getting a lot more. You see that wedge is widening and widening. Bioenergy and nuclear. We're getting that green wedge of solar and wind because it's so incredibly inexpensive. And if you want to see how inexpensive it is, you go and open up another graph. This graph is the marginal cost of electricity production. What does it cost to make a kilowatt hour, a small amount of electricity? See that green line? That green line is wind and solar down, 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 getting cheaper and cheaper. There's a reinforcing feedback loop called economies of scale that the more you build, the cheaper it gets. The more you build, the cheaper it gets. It gets cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. Cheaper than coal, cheaper than natural gas. That's why it's growing so much. In this scenario, I just showed you where we get our energy, but there are some other very important sources 
I'm going to pull up greenhouse gas, all the gases. The other main CO2 source, carbon dioxide, is from land use, bioenergy, burning trees, deforestation, and burning those trees in Indonesia, in Brazil, in order to clear forests for agricultural land, forest degradation all around the world. That's the green area. This dark area is coal, oil, and gas. On top of it are these other gases, the blue methane from energy, from waste, from agriculture, F gases there in yellow, and on top of it, nitrous oxide. Those are all the gases. Because of those gases going into the atmosphere, temperature is going up to 3.3, and we can see temperature there rising and rising. This is the stuff, this is the heat that is fueling those the heating of the Gulf of Mexico, and then on to the other impacts that you saw, like ocean life, like the other impacts on extinction rates. Okay, so there's the baseline. My question to you, how shall we do better? What shall we do to prevent as much of that as possible? Go to your poll, and what you'll see is a big list of, you can vote multiple times, encourage renewable energy, remove subsidies from fossil fuel, encourage nuclear, zero carbon energy supplies like fusion, thorium fission, setting a carbon price, I showed you that before, energy efficiency and transport. This is more efficient cars, buses, ships, airplanes, uh, better uh, systems for land use such that we can use public transportation, walkability, buildings and industry, motors and uh, performance standards for appliances, bioenergy, burning trees for energy. This is uh, the electric car revolution that we see so much of right here. Electrified, this is heat pumps, buildings and industry, reducing deforestation, Increasing afforestation, planting trees, methane and other gases, carbon removal. No, let's just phase out fossil fuels is the last one. Set policies to phase them out. Carbon price is getting the most votes. Energy efficiency is getting a lot of votes. These are great suggestions. We're going to go test them in a minute and see how much better can we do if we apply ourselves to this challenge. Okay, what do I see? Carbon price, energy efficiency, phase out, and renewables. Here's where we were. All right, I'm going to reset these graphs. I'm going to make it really big. And just one note, uh, as I start to play with this, you may wonder, well, how is he doing all this? How does this even work? How do you build confidence in a model like this to know that you should believe what's coming out of it. And I just want to note that we've built this with our collaborators at MIT using the best available science and data sources such as the International Energy Agency, the IPCC. And you can see many of the data sources. If you just click on the little triangle here, you can see the where we get it, what studies, et cetera. And all of the equations are here under help, under the model technical reference. And you can go to any section and see how do we set it up? What are the equations in it? What is the structure of it? This is showing biomass carbon and soil carbon, how we built that. And then every equation, and I saw Chris Campbell, our developer, our lead development engineer is here. Uh, he set this up so that you can go and look at the data and you can go see every constant, every equation is shared here. We're also increasingly developing more tools for sharing our comparisons of the data. We do a lot of work to make sure we're consistent with other what are called integrated assessment models. These are models that are published. There's one in the US, 
one in Austria, one in Germany, pulled together by the NGFS, the Network for the Greening of the Financial System. And we can see our blue line and then the other models in brown and blue and purple in the International Energy Agency and what's called the Production Gap Report. And then see under scenarios where we reduce emissions, how are we, how consistent are we with others? And we're experimenting with showing statistics. I know this is not, this does not exist yet out in the world, but I want to say this is the kind of approach that we take where we try to be very transparent with this non-black box model to share it with others. Of course, many assumptions in it, some you may not agree with fully and you say, hey, I want to see how is it different if the climate sensitivity to a doubling of carbon was different. That is when there's CO2 in the atmosphere, temperature goes up more or less. Here it is. We say that number is three. If it's lower, temperature is lower. If it's higher, temperature would be higher. Okay. We make some of it transparent. Okay. That's just all the confidence building. What are we doing? We're testing your policies. What did you say? Carbon pricing, carbon pricing. We're going to look under here. How about we say $100 a ton? I'm going to change this to 100. Think, what do you think it's going to do? What does that temperature do? Does it go down to 1.8, 2.3, 2.8, 3 1.4? $100 a ton around the world adds about 80 cents to a gas gallon of gas. And what a big difference. Doesn't solve the whole problem, but gets us down to 2.7. Why? Look over on the left what it's doing to coal. Look how much coal drops. That brown wedge of coal shrinking. Blue in natural gas shrinks. And if you look at the width of the green area of wind and solar, it goes up because it has less competition. Less competition for wind and solar. Oil, though, seems pretty stable. Doesn't seem to change quite as much. Let's go see. We can go look at everything. Well, oil does shrink instead of peaking out in the 2040s. It peaks here in mid-2020s and falls slowly. Less oil. What else would need to be done? Many of you said transportation, energy efficiency. We get more efficient, less oil. Electrification, less oil as well. Electrification, working with decarbonization there, get us emissions down to 2.8. Six, you also said, hey, why don't we just phase out fossil fuels? And here we are with coal. We're getting a reduction in coal with the carbon price. But many of you said, let's phase them out. Click on the dots, reduce new coal infrastructure. If we were to cut 92% of all new investment, then that gets us not just less coal, but all the way through the end of the century, a good bit less. We can do the same thing with oil. Let's go look and see if we were to reduce oil significantly. There's talk of the fossil fuel treaty, non-proliferation treaty. That would be something else that would get to 2.5. You mentioned energy efficiency, buildings and industry, motors, performance standards, appliances, gets us down to 2.3. You notice there's no one big thing that does all of this. It's taking many actions in many different areas. Nuclear help, excuse me, renewables help. Over here, deforestation and land degradation is another 0.1 degree. Did you see that? That 2.3 went down to 2.2. We really haven't done too much in methane. The blue area is shrinking. This is, you can see methane in energy production in blue, agriculture and waste. I'll show you how much it's changed already. I'm going to undo everything back to the 3.3. Under no action, this is what we see with methane. But now I'm going to go back to what we just tested. With all these actions on energy, we have less coal, oil, and gas. That means less methane. What if we fixed leaks as well and cut 
industrial use of F gases and nitrous oxide. We can get that 2.2 down to 2.0. Agricultural emissions, best practices for capturing manure, feeding uh, cows better, et cetera. Changing diets and food waste. This was the kind of things that get us down to well below two degrees. Maybe there's some carbon removal that could be done that would get us down a little bit lower towards 1.7. Okay, I put in many of your policies. Here's what it adds up to. Oh, I didn't do electrification. Um, if we take action across the board here, we can bend this curve. When I said our goal is to get greenhouse gas emissions falling rapidly, this is what I'm talking about. Getting us towards 1.7 degrees. So how did we do on those two measures? And I'm going to ask another poll question. When you think of the threat to extinction in those marine animals and in land-based, I want to let me go back and, and, and ask this poll. This is going to be a, a more advanced question. Let me just see. I know I put this in here. In what decade? So here's another poll question. I'm going to ask you about that concern about extinction rates. In what decade does this set of policies help improve this impact? 2020s, 2030s, 2060s. Twenty twenties, twenty thirties, twenty fifties. It's interesting. Our intuition about dynamics, about the delays in the system. You can see how the heterogeneity, how much disagreement there is in the group about when this policy is going to kick in. That's why we're here. You need a mathematical computer model in order to do the kind of math to answer a question like this. Decision makers need to know. They need to know when are things going to get better. Most people think of 2020s, 2030s. Let's go look. Okay, let's go look. I'm going to pull up. I said it was that threat to ex extinction. And here it is. First of all, before the timing, look at the incredibly good news about how much avoided threat of extinction particularly on marine animals, when we don't have that much warming of the oceans from there to there. Look how much lower it is. That's the baseline. This is the world we just created. So, so much better. This is good news. The challenging news is the answer to the question I just asked you. In what decade? And the answer is the 2040s. Why? This is one that is very temperature dependent. And temperature doesn't really depart from the baseline until the 2040s. Why? That's because it takes a long time for the concentration of carbon in the atmosphere to even react. You've got to bring emissions down to the point of removals of carbon going into the oceans and into the plants for it even to level out. That takes till like 2040, then we have the blankets over earth starting to recede, not as much insulation. And then there already is a lot of momentum that's been built up in heat in the global system, such that temperature bends in the 2040s. The short version is there is a lot of inertia in this system and it takes some time. And when that temperature bends over, that's when we start seeing the benefit here. So I don't want to sugarcoat all of this. We have baked in some impacts for some time. We still need to do everything we can to avoid this, but this is why we need to prepare marine animals and land animals systems and ecosystems for what is coming no matter what. I want to ask again, though. I want to ask this again. I'm going to reset, clear those responses, I'm going to clear all these responses. And I'm going to ask you again. Now I want you to think about air quality, P2, 
PM 2.5 emissions. These are the small particles that cause cardiovascular disease, asthma, lung disease, and air quality and visibility issues. If you've been to Delhi, if you've been to Beijing, you've seen this. In what decade do the set of policies help improve air quality? Huge medical costs due to this factor. In what decade does it help? Most of you think the 2020s, some think it's more delayed. Let's go and check it out. Under impacts here, scroll down to air pollution from energy, and you were right. This is one that is not delayed at all. It dives here in the 2020s. Down, 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 down. Why? Well, you'll notice its shape is a lot like its main source. What is the main source? It's the same shape as coal. This is primarily driven by coal. I actually think we have, uh, you can see that a little bit is from bioenergy, a little bit from oil, but it's mostly about coal. So some good news, this impact not delayed at all. Okay. Be smart about the delays in the system when things get better over what time horizon. It has implications for mitigation strategy, but also for adaptation strategy. When we look at an environmental justice factor like this, we realize the importance of equity and the benefits to equity and the ways that we do what Dr. Beth Sawin, co-founder of Climate Interactive, calls multi-solving. Reduce the temperature with climate action. Reduce health problems here by reducing air quality uh, or improving air quality. Multi-solving, solving several problems together. And the offer, of course, is to help decision makers see some of these benefits. But now I just want to appreciate a little bit about this scenario that we just created, particularly how much better it is. I've been talking to you, with you for a good bit of time. I'm going to be silent for 60 seconds. And I'd like you to think what you would love about being part of a world that's on track to putting these kinds of policies together. What would you love about making something like this happen? I'm getting my clock open. And I'm going to set the timer. Let's just be silent and think. What would you love about being part of a world on track to making something like this happen? Okay, that was a minute. Please go to the poll. Please go to the poll and share of yourself. What would you love? Please type it in here. What would you love about being part of a world on track to making something like that happen? Fewer disasters, clean air more biodiversity, clean air and water for more people, leave a better place for future generations. Clean air, breathing clean air. A well-being economy, smile. Thank you. 
faith in humanity, when we lose faith in our people, that's, that's a tough spot. Reducing biodiversity, a huge sense of relief. I'll tell you, we just got water finally after 19 days. And that kind of relief, the kind of relief from knowing that we were on track would feel so good. A future, joy in nature, more justice for all, helping your grandkids and their families survive, being able to be hopeful for the future, leaving a worthwhile legacy. Fairness, equity, simpler, less divisive humanity. Feeling respect for the elected persons of our democracy, earned respect, well said, better air quality, better air quality, restoring a livable world for your grandchildren, much less concern for the future of my grandchildren and all of the young people, young, fewer infant deaths. We just saw some new data on premature deaths, premature births, excuse me. We would have less premature births being part of the natural world. Fantastic. And notice really what it took here to make this happen. There was no one thing we should be fighting for. Each of us should absolutely advocate for policy, but there isn't one big solution that we need to discover to make this happen. Instead, it takes many seeds planted in many different places to grow this garden. And it's still possible to bend these curves to avoid the worst case scenarios. The priorities, the priorities were things, I'll show you what, what it really took. The priorities were things that reduced emissions from fossil fuel. That didn't just transition away, but phased out emissions from fossil fuel. See how steep that is. And cut emissions from methane and from other of these gases, from nitrous oxide and F gases. And then finally, from land use CO2 and then getting to bit net negative land use CO2. Things that reduce coal, oil, and gas, methane, and protect forests in the next 10 or 15 years. Those are the priorities. And we haven't looked at them. Other webinars will go there about many of the lower priority, possibly helpful, but not significantly priority actions in other domains. It's still possible to bend this curve. Now, I'll offer to you is this tool as a way to go to your top decision makers in government, in business, in civil society, to your friends and family and communities. And what is happening around the world is that more people are seeing that this is in 20 languages and we have created a training course that you can go and use, 63 videos, 31 fun quizzes to learn how to run workshops, to go to your decision makers. And the key is you're not telling them what to do. You're creating a space for them to test their thinking about how to address this challenge. Here are some of the pictures at Ikea and they're playing the game version. See, they're in uniforms and in costumes here in Washington, D.C. with Crystal Noiser out of MIT. This is at Hofstra University, students, and in Peru, and in Ghana. These are folks who ran an event and sent us their pictures. Here in Miami, I think Ava was there at that one. Here, Ellie Johnston at South by Southwest. Here in Peru, in Canada. Our invitation is to become one of the people who goes and does this somewhere in the world. So this is what we're encouraging you towards. I did want to close the loop a little bit more. I kind of, I think, left you hanging <laughs> with what happens in a community where 
we've seen this, this kind of impact that I showed you at the start 19 days ago. And um, of course we lost electricity, we lost power, we lost electricity for a week. We did not have running water for this last 18 days. Now, mind you, I'm gonna pull up some of the pictures of, of what happens next. 46% uh, of the world does not have piped drinking water and flushing water. So <laughs> we know it's such a privilege to even have the chance to have water come into our homes. We have built a world around assuming that's gonna be the deal. So when we don't have it, the challenge comes up pretty high. So home flushing plan, these are my buckets. There's a little creek, I can see it out my window right here. And I had that little, little water bottles you see floating. And I had enough of a flow that I was able to collect water, put it in a bucket, carry it up to flush the toilet. So that's what I was doing for myself. Then there were opportunities to go to neighborhoods. This is our register of deeds every day. It was amazing, everybody. At 10 a.m., Ellie pointed me to this. At 10 a.m., people would gather downtown as volunteers and say, all right, what needs to be done? He said, we need the flush brigade. We need to go to low-income housing developments. They're not able to flush their toilet. There is a public health emergency that could be coming. They took a tankers of water there. We carried the buckets, flushed the toilets. Another day, they said, we have 15,000 people missing, unaccounted for in this region. They gave us a list, each of us, 10 people, phone numbers, addresses, and we drove up the hollers to go find who we could find. I got to find eight people who were fine, their cousins, their kids, their parents, and called the county to say, we can't find grandpa, go and check on him. 237 people were not found. One of them was our neighborhood pharmacist. Another was an employee of a friend of mine. Um, and that we just had our first set of funerals here. They then asked us, could we go to some of the retirement communities? And uh, I met Glenda Henderson, who told me that she lost her house in 2004 in another hurricane. She rebuilt because they said it would be fine. It was lost again three weeks ago in Hurricane Helene, Glenda told me. I wrote up her story on LinkedIn if you care about that. After my family, I mean, <laughs> we got my mom out of town, we got my son out of town. Uh, the communities that couldn't flush, the retirement communities in my neighborhood, then we found uh, someone who was bringing in these totes. We got seven totes, these amazing people. This is West Drawbaugh, seven people. Uh, built the plumbing to have flushable totes within 50 meters of everybody so they could go flush their toilets. So this is just a little bit of the beautiful rising of people to a challenge. I got to spend a couple of days in this warehouse, hearts with hands out in Swannanoa, taking donations, sorting them into these bins, and then they would take it out to the tens of thousands of people who don't have access to warm clothes and to food and water who are out in this region struggling right now. Okay, what was remarkable about it is the ability of people to rise to the challenge in an emergency. And then my request to you and to all of us, can we find the same urgency when it comes to preventing this problem and preparing for what is coming that we know. Can we find that focus and urgency that my community had in dealing with this disaster? To go to our elected officials and say, we can do better, we know what needs to be done. Stand up against the forces that are stopping us from change. Go to the businesses, go to the communities, focus us on the highest leverage actions. We can do better. We know how to do it.
It's not going to be easy. It's going to be worth it. Let's go get them, everybody.